Hello, hi. Welcome to the Archimedes stage, good afternoon. Next up we have Mr. Tim Yannick, who is an expert programmer in free and open source software and managing director of Lenedo GmbH. And he will be speaking about open source in business. Hello everyone, can you hear me fine? Okay, ah great, so we got video now. Okay, so as uh, she just said, um, I'm Managing Director for Lanedo GmbH. Uh, that's a small open source consulting company based in Hamburg. And uh, today I'm going to be talking about open source in business. Uh, I'm going to give a short introduction and then talk about how open source enters businesses. Um, what to do uh, if you have a client and you're going to be doing an open source project with them, one way or the other. Um, then we're going to be touching a little bit on licensing about open source, because uh, often that also is, is a matter when you, when you have a client um, that you're doing open source with. And after that, uh, how to actually do, um, let's say, implement and plan the open source project uh, with the client. So it's all focused on open, doing open source and uh, running a business around it. Oh. Okay, so um, the company I'm working for is Lanedo GmbH. Uh, we have two founders. Uh, one is Martin Russell, who is over there, and uh, I'm the other one. We, uh, we've originally started out with another company in 2004, a Swedish one, uh, that, um, uh, that, uh, st uh, that stopped business around 2000, uh, 2009, where we took over. And um, we have... Uh, only open source programmers in our company. That actually means we are hiring people out of uh, different open source communities who have a proven track record on working on open source projects. For instance, GIMP or uh, GTK, GNOME. Um, Everybody is uh, uh, located in Europe and people are working from home. That actually makes it cheaper because you don't have to have an office in every city. And uh, that's kind of like a necessity if you have uh, people very, very spread out, like in different countries. Um, right, you talked about the backgrounds already. Uh, we, we just, last year we had two more programmers joining us from the LibreOffice community, for instance. And um, in general, that actually guarantees that our people know open source. They have good connections when they join us. And... Uh, they have a lot of experience in the areas that uh, the clients are actually needing us for open source. So a project that we've been working on is, for instance, uh, modem support for Iridium satellite modems. Um, we've been working on uh, getting GTK, uh, the GNOME toolkit, or GIMP toolkit originally, and the graphics toolkit to get that to work on, on uh, embedded devices. We've been doing that for Nokia, we've been doing that for Samsung. Uh, we've been optimizing the graphics pipeline there to, to make it really fast on mobile phones, um, to adapt it for touch screens, all, that, uh, all that's related to, uh, to, to, to getting a toolkit to work on a mobile and embedded device. Um, another project we've been working on is uh, Tracker. And Tracker is a metadata um, search engine that would, for instance, uh, search, um, index the data on your phone, uh, keep a list of MP3s you got on there, albums, etc., and make that easily searchable for you. Uh, we've been doing the um, iOS and OS X toolkit support for .NET under Mac, which is actually Mono. Uh, there's another company, Xamarin, that uh, has the Mono project, which gets .NET to work on Mac. Um, we've been working for Google on the Chromebook uh, network drivers for 3G and 4G. Uh, we've been working with the OPC. Um, project, the one laptop per child project on, uh, the, on the touch interface. And also we've been doing LibreOffice projects lately, uh, especially, or most prominent actually uh, as part of the Linux project, which is um, running Linux in the Munich municipal. And they're actually migrating to LibreOffice at this point. Right, enough about our company. I'm going to actually get, jump into uh, open source consultancy. So a lot of companies well, not everyone, but a lot of companies that we've been having as clients and didn't really know how to approach open source when we started working for them. It's, it's v most companies out there actually do use open source these days in one way or the other, but it's not necessarily known. Often, 
uh, developers, engineers, administrators are using open source, sometimes even de uh, deploying open source without the managers, especially top level managers, knowing about it or acknowledging it. I know one company that builds their entire infrastructure around Hadoop, for instance, and isn't aware at the top level that Hadoop is actually open source. So these kind of things happen very often in the practice, even though if you do have an open source background, you wouldn't necessarily expect that. Um, an open source project, most often you have a big community without a central committee that you could approach and, let's say, direct uh, or steer uh, the efforts. And um, that's one of the things that's, that's a lot different from proprietary projects. And uh, the companies often have a hard, a hard way of understanding. Um, so if you do consulting for, for a company that actually uses open source and you do open source consulting, you do the community interaction with them, um, often you have to explain that um, you need to be interacting with the community also as a consultant and uh, you need to come to agreement. You need to get collaboration going with the open source projects. And uh, y even as a consultant uh, who is forefronting an open source contract, uh, who is forefronting an open source project towards a customer, uh, you cannot necessarily guarantee, let's say, a certain development is upstream, for instance. So, I was just saying, um, the way open source often enters companies is by engineers, administrators, and the likes starting to deploy them. Sometimes for the web server, like uh, we've got LAMP here, Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP, or these days maybe MariaDB. Um, Hadoop is another example. Nagios for monitoring your systems is uh, fairly widespread, well, widely used. You could, you could use Nagios, for instance, to also monitor, your, monitor the availability of your Windows system. So uh, a lot of these projects actually enter regular uh, companies that might be running a, l a vast number of, of uh, Windows uh, desktops, but still be using open source on the server side very often. And um, if you get into the embedded device development, for instance, uh, you'd usually use one of the tools like GCC, Eclipse, Java. Each of these tools is open source. And as I said earlier, not all the companies are really aware that they are using open source, that they're de uh, depending on open source. And at some point, probably have to interact with the open source projects. Um, Android is to a large part open source. Migo used to be Moblin. Those are open source. Uh, platforms that have been started for mobile phones by Nokia, by Intel, for instance. They were entirely based around open source, and uh, even those companies had to learn how to deal with the open source projects. Um, they went into the project for various reasons that we're going to be getting into later, but uh, not necessarily because they knew what they were going to be approaching or what they were going to be experiencing while they're developing the platforms. Um, and of course, kernels, yeah. So the majority of mobile devices out there are actually running the Linux, uh, Linux kernel these days, be particularly because Android is based on Linux, and Android by now is the, by, like, uh, uh, the major mobile platform. And even the um, Apple system is based on an open source kernel, even though it's not Linux. Right, so how do you use um, open source in practice? in those companies. Um, as I said, usually it's not a top-down management decision, but it comes from bottom-up, uh, which means people are downloading open source because they need it, for instance, Eclipse or a compiler or, what, or maybe a library. They build it, they use it. Well, that's simple, okay? There shouldn't be much attached to that. Except that at some point you do need some modifications and you go into the code, maybe you, you first start configuring the thing, later on you think, oh, not everything is configurable, so I might actually need to do a few code alterations. So you do a few alterations, you recompile, you use it again, another one, and another month comes another requirement, so you're implementing that. So code gets modified more and more and more. And at some point you have to, you have, to have a plan because you're, you're actually gradually slipped into pretty much software development uh, with a project that might not even, might not even originate at, at your company. And you have, to, you have to make sure that you're getting updates, stability fixes, for instance, from upstream, but you've modified your code, so there could be conflicts arising. So at some point, those, mo those small modifications that you might just have started out <coughs> doing just in order to be, using, uh, to be able to use the software, at some point, those become so complex that you get into conflicts and, and really need some kind of strategy to be working together with the open source community. 
because maintenance is becoming harder. Um, your code has been much more different from upstream. And um, on most companies, a few people start using open source. Those few people know how to, how to set up the project, but it's not widespread. It's, it's not widely acknowledged, which means also there's a know-how about the specific open source project, about the specific project, how to set it up, how to run it, how to keep modifying it. It's concentrated on the very few people inside a company, maybe sometimes just a system administrator. And if he's gone, the company is often left with a project that they have no idea how to continue maintenance or not, that a new person would have a hard time getting into. So um, what actually means uh, running an open source project in, uh, in a company? Or why do you actually uh, use open source in the first place? especially in a business context. Well, first, the source code is available. That means it's highly configurable. You can adapt that to any kind of uh, situation you might, uh, you might cater for. Um, there are no financial costs to test, which means it's really easy to get. And those two things, <coughs> those two things are actually major benefits for companies as well to be using open source. So they really love that. Companies love code being available and modifiable, and they love it uh, being for free, because companies, of, obviously, they're obvi uh, they are optimizing for revenue, so they wanna, don't want to be spending extra money. So for, for Microsoft, for instance, you can spend a lot of money just per CPU or per seat just for using your software. So those things are actually quite important benefits for, um, in open source for companies. Now, getting more into the matter, they actually find out that um, on open source projects, people have to be collaborating, which is not often what uh, companies are striving for, especially if you want to have a, uh, a lot of control over the projects. And it's not usually what you do with a proprietary software project either. Um, no exclusive rights are granted. That actually becomes interesting if you're developing your platform based on open source, like Android, for instance, or other mobile phone platforms. You're, you're using libraries that you, that you don't have the exclusive um, access and distribution rights to. So everybody else could actually be using that part of your software as well, which is, again, different from proprietary software. So not all comp companies are used to that. Um, multiple parties are actually sharing their investment. That's also a bit unusual. So not all companies are very fam familiar with that or are liking the fact from the start. And everybody else can influence and contribute a project. So that's often a no-go for companies. <laughs> because they want, often they want to have a lot of control. So the first two points in open source are what, company, what, what is a major benefit with um, regards to, uh, in contrast to proprietary software in, in your company. And the other points are where open source diverges in a way that often companies use the proprietary software don't actually prefer that, at least for a start, because we're going to be getting into why those are actually benefits later on also. So benefits of open source in general. Um, well, and of course, in, in a business concept. But, um, copyleft. Many open source projects out there are under copyleft license. Many means three quarters, actually. 50% uh, of the open source projects out there are GPL. Another 25% of the open source projects are LGPL. Both of them are copyleft licenses. And the rest is then divided up by BSD, MIT, Apache license, and so forth which are more permissive. But, so the majority is actually under copyleft. And copyleft means that if you use the open source software and you modify it, you have to pass on the, mod the modifications to anybody that you give your software in order to run it. Now that sets it apart from the Apache license, for instance. You can modify Apache and pass Apache on without having to pass on the modifications. If you have to pass on your source code modifications, that's copyleft. So, the Apache license is actually called permissive. The Apache or the MIT license are both examples of uh, licenses that you just get, and for, for the most part, you can use them as is. You can modify them. You can take them proprietary. And that is what um, Apple did um, with their kernel. They used an open source project. They modified it. They adapted it for their platform. They based an entire operating system around it. And they passed none of the modifications onto the upstream project because the license didn't require it. But well, that's about the Apple kernel. There are other projects, for instance, WebKit, where Apple is participating, where they are passing the changes back into an upstream project because uh, WebKit is using, an op uh, is using a copyleft license. <coughs> so um, if you publicly release your uh, open source code, 
that actually preserves coding efforts. Now, what that means is, um, regardless of what you do later on, whether you walk away, whether you discontinue work on the project, or maybe even take that into uh, your proprietary kernel, the code is publicly released on an open source license. That means it's going to be staying available for the rest of the world. Um, another thing that's quite interesting, actually, is uh, I haven't experienced this so much myself as, a, um, as an explicit benefit because um, I've always been involved in open source. I started working on open source projects and later on got into open source and business and then ran my own open source company. But um, I've heard from other people that are actually doing development for proprietary uh, software projects and the companies basing their business around proprietary projects that um, some of them are feeling a lack of purpose. Sometimes they're just working for a bank for a decade. And uh, they do, they're getting the money from that, for, for, for feeding their family, but they don't feel like it's doing a lot of good, let's say, in a more general sense. And most often, that's not a problem that open source pro um, developers are having, because they usually feel they can contribute to a wider cause. To, if you take it to the extreme, would actually consider that open source has been, has been about open contact, uh, content back in the 80s, when Richard Stormont actually started the GNU project, then the 90s became much wider known with the Linux kernel, and uh, 2000 and onward actually entered business. And um, there are more and more awareness in the society uh, was created about open contact, which spawned things like the, Wiki, uh, the Wikipedia project, for instance. And I think that's one of those, that, that, that's one of those things that really furthers our society, and open source is driving all of that, of course. So as I said, many open source uh, developers actually have more of a sense of accomplishment with the project they're working on, even though they might actually sometimes make lesser money than uh, developers on proprietary software projects. Which one is your pick is obviously uh, every individual, individual's own choice. Um, and then collaboration. Uh, the Linux kernel is the best is the best example here because the Linux kernel at this point is the largest software project in the entire history of software development. So that includes Microsoft Windows, that includes Apple, that includes mainframe developments, everything. The Linux kernel is the largest software development project at this point in terms of lines of code and amount of contributors. You just need to watch a talk from like Linus or Greg Crowe Hartman about the statistics of the Linux kernel, and it's going to blow you away if you're used to a smaller software project in any kind of proprietary or even open source uh, context. So no single company would have been able to write um, a system as complex and um, as widely adaptable as a Linux kernel. No single entity would have actually been able to fund the money from that, and that includes Microsoft. Um, for obvious reasons, you can just compare the Windows kernel with the Linux kernel, and you'll figure that Microsoft wasn't able to beat that. From a technical perspective and from the amount of people, and considering the amount of people that are working on the project. So, why do companies actually need open source? They could be going proprietary all, <coughs> all along. Now, um, we just said, um, the collaboration leads to bigger projects that have higher accomplishment than you can do in a proprietary context. Um, but also, there's some other, let's say, not so obvious benefits to using open source. For instance, libraries. Libraries have an obligation to be archiving data and making it, or, or keeping it accessible for future generations. Generations means something like 20, 50, 100 years from now. Now consider where you guys stored your data, if you happen to be old enough, where you guys stored your data 10 or 20 years ago. Probably disks, or maybe even media that predate disks. Could you read them these days? Most people can actually read a disk, uh, a normal diskette, like a floppy disk um, at this point. So at some point you would have had to transfer the data to a, to a different media. And often you have similar problems with the formats. Now this is a major thing that libraries are running into. Um, they can archive things now and can access and read things now, but how are they going to make sure that that's going to be the case for uh, in, in 50 years from now? And if you're using open source, if you're using an open, an open format, you at least have the logic available, for instance, to parse a file format. 
And um, by putting, let's say, some effort behind it, so like, let's say a bunch of developers, for instance, that, that keep migrating your code, porting that to new platforms, you can make sure that you are able to read those formats in 50 years from now. Well, that's a major benefit of open source. There are many, there's a lot of data um, that was stored in some proprietary format 20 years ago. The company went bankrupt, nobody maintained the software, you cannot access the data up to this day. Simply because there's no documentation about the file format, and there was a single version of the software that was once used to be accessing the data, and that's just not available at anymore. Um, if I'm going too fast, or if I'm leaving something out, please just tell me. It's, it's the first time I'm doing this talk, so maybe I'm not addressing you correctly, or maybe I'm boring you. Just give me feedback, okay? Um, right, trust your software. So when you run proprietary software, um, you can see some of its effect, but you don't see everything that it does. For instance, does your software communicate with a server uh, on the internet while you're not looking at it, while you're maybe not monitoring the network interfaces? Uh, it might be a display in dialog that says it's not to, but could you trust it? Now the thing is with open source, you can actually inspect it. You can inspect it down to every single line of code, and you can figure whether it does it or not. That doesn't mean that everybody is actually able to do that, but um, you can take your code, you can give it to a person that you trust, of your choosing, and you have that person audit your code and figure whether it does what you want, whether it, whether it keeps its behavior within a realm that's acceptable for you or not. And that's, that, that would be auditing. So that's possible as open source. You don't get this kind of freedom with a proprietary software project. Um, so let's say you're, uh, you're building your platform around open source, like, for instance, Android or uh, like an, any of the other embedded devices. You often have uh, specific constraints like a uh, small amount of memory, small amounts of uh, CPU uh, power, etc. cetera. Um, with open source projects, as I said, you get access down to every single line of code. So uh, at least in theory, uh, you can size it down to say the chunk that is really important to you. Now again, that depends on your abilities, but in the end you could always hand it over to an open source developer who does the job for you. So with open source you can basically, uh, you, you would have unlimited, uh, unlimited uh, configurability, which is one of the major reasons that's, uh, that companies who are, uh, who are working on quick development of platforms and, and newer ones are actually basing large parts of those on open source. Um, you can influence the future development. Now, how many of you have actually uh, gone to Microsoft and said, I want this feature in Word or Excel and gotten that? I mean, raise your hand. Okay, no hands there. So that's possible with an open source project. You can go into Bugzilla um, for most projects and file a bug say, I want this feature request. That doesn't mean it's going to be implemented, but if many people want that, they might be commenting there, they might be voting for it, and the community m might recognize that that's a feature worthwhile to be implemented. So you can actually, even if you're not non-programming, you can influence what your open source project does. So you do have, to some degree, influence over future developments and features. And if you have a lot of money because you happen to be running a company or because you happen to be uh, leading a team with a budget, you can actually have some developers work on a specific feature and merge that into the upstream project. So there is a lot more influence. I wouldn't say control because there are a lot of other things happening in most uh, open source projects as well, but you have a lot of influence into an open source project. So actually, the more you're engaging, the more you can influence that. And that means you get some degree of control where the future developments are going, whether it's suitable for your platform or whatever other you need you might have. Hosting, con oh, oh, sorry. Hosting control, now, that's an interesting point, at least these days. Um, I've just recently read an article that for a European company to be hosting their data on a US server, for instance on a cloud, is bordering on the illegal because of privacy regulations we are having in the EU. Um, many, we've, we've got business laws in the EU that require data about your business to be stored on European soil. Now you can go for a cloud provider that actually stores your data, let's say in Ireland. There are a lot of um, data centers. Um, but you still have one problem. You cannot guarantee that the data, that's, uh, when it's being transferred from a data center to your personal servers, is, is not passing over, let's say, US soil, like soil out of the EU. And what that means is it could be tapped on, and that could be violating privacy regulations that also apply to any data you're storing, for instance, about your customers. Um, and that's why I'm not a lawyer. So um, keep that in mind. But that's why, as I said, I read an article here. Um, 
the storage of data <coughs> on a hosted server for a European company is bordering on the illegal. Consult your lawyer on like how illegal might be in your specific case. Now, if you want to be safe, and most, that's what most businesses strive for, or at least some, <laughs> um, you need some kind of control over where your data is stored. And uh, you might still want to get into uh, the cloud services. So you have one server that stores all your data and you have a lot of, let's say, thinner client machines that are accessing those. Um, the way to do that is uh, you control your own server. You host your own cloud server. And that's what the OpenStack project is about. OpenStack is a cloud server as an open source project that everybody can run on their own. Uh, can run on their own machine, can run inside their own network so they, can, they have full control over where the data is stored and how it's being transferred. Um, oh, uh, yeah, and obviously the point is you couldn't do that, let's say, with Amazon's proud <coughs> cloud services because those are proprietary. They won't give you the, the, uh, the software that they're running on their servers. And even if they did, you wouldn't know what exactly it does. That's the uh, auditing and trusting point I made earlier. Um, oh, and then uh, for developers themselves, um, on a proprietary software project, most often you can do whatever you want as long as it meets the requirements to some extent, and how exactly that is achieved often doesn't um, play too much of a role uh, because you just write it, you compile it, you run it, you move on to some, uh, something else. Um, which means that there's at, least, there's at least some possibility there that in proprietary software policy there's a lot of bad code in there um, that is less likely with open source. Um, there's a lot of bad open source code out there for one reason that is many people are actually uh, learning how to program, so they write some programs that release that, and that's open source, obviously. And because I've been learning, it, it doesn't need to be, um, it doesn't need to be top-notch code. But the projects that are successful, that are being developed on for a while, for years even, usually have gathered um, a lot of experienced programmers that have been reviewing the code, they've been changing and improving the code, which means that through peer review, it's been getting better and better over time. Okay, so what do businesses benefit from uh, going into open source? Wait, is this really 25 minutes past already? Mm. I think I need to speed up a bit here. <laughs> um, is there a 38 more slow? Mm -hmm. Okay, so business benefits from open source. A company go getting into open source. Um, other than the ones I already listed, there are some that are really specific in a business context. You get excellent recruiting opportunities. As I said earlier, um, open source projects usually attract good developers. And um, some of them may or may not have a job. And uh, some of them definitely are looking for a new job. Actually, the majority of people who are employed in some company are always looking for other job opportunities, even though they might not actually be changing, but they're at least looking for it. So getting into open source is going to give you access to a lot of really good technical people. So you get excellent recruiting abilities. Um, you create, you create mindshare about the expertise of your company, about the expertise of individuals. Uh, you can leverage on your competitors' efforts. Now that's something completely unique to open source. A proprietary pr software project, if they have another company who's doing something similar to mine, but maybe a bit better, they're competing with me. In open source, we might be contributing to the same project, we might be building on top of each other's work, and both of them actually get a better product out of that. Um, and obviously, I've, I've touched on that earlier, you do, you do get to control what you pay for, because that would be what you put your developers at uh, onto contributing to the project, and that way also what you don't pay for. Now, I try to do that with Microsoft. Say, I just, want, I just want, let's say, the financial functions of the spreadsheet, and I don't want to pay for any of the other features. It's just, there's no, no sort of uh, configurability with the prices from Microsoft like that. Uh, how do companies idly uh, approach open source? Where usually, if you get into an open source project, that could be LibreOffice, it could be Linux kernel, whatever it is, and you know nothing about it, how should you go into it? Well, you should first get to know the community because projects are always about the communities. No project is any more important than the people around it. So get to know the people. See how they're communicating. IRC channels, mailing lists, forums. Look at blogs, planets that might be aggregating those blogs. So basically get to know the community. Then identify key players, because uh, you usually want to build up good connections with those in order to be able to influence the project, in order to get your code into the project. Um, help them. 
help to answer questions in forums, um, help reproducing bug reports, work on the easy hacks list. The LibreOffice project has an easy hacks list. Many projects don't help compiling an, an easy hacks list. They usually have a wiki. So you go through the bug reports here, which ones are uh, possibly easy to implement, which ones are voted for, should be fixed, and create a list of those. So new programmers have an easy entrance into the program, uh, into the project. Um, help at organizing conferences. We've got a lot of volunteers over here. We're doing great work. So you can do that for many other open source projects as well, because many projects are actually exhibiting at some contents one way or the other. The Gouda conference, Linux Talk, uh, FOSTEM. There are a lot of conferences where you can help organizing, sponsoring if you're a company, uh, volunteer with your time, volunteer with some PR, blog about it, for instance. <coughs> And then if you actually, at some point, start modifying source code or you write components that should be open source, consider how good your changes are upstreamable. Consider whether what you're implementing is for your company only or if it's useful for a broader audience and should be going into the upstream project. Um, and if that is the case, upstream as early as possible, because otherwise you're going to be getting a lot of conflicts and problems later on. So here's an example of a project that Nokia did back in 2004, maybe even before that. Um, they took GTK, uh, the GNOME toolkit for, for their N900 device. They modified more than 50,000 lines of code over the course of one or two years. And then they figured, what are we going to do with this mess now? Because of a completely different thing than upstream. They didn't get any of the updates from upstream. It, nothing of their functionality was in upstream. So basically, they just started on hacking to get going on the platform quickly, which is actually good to, to have, to let's say, have some, some short uh, uh, iterations. But um, they quickly got themselves into a problem where they had so many changes they couldn't really manage them anymore. So they changed more than 250 files, and they just had a, had a really huge pile of mess. There wasn't anything they could really do with that. So that was an open source project failing, at least for a start. Because they were at least clever enough to be hiring a consultant who would go over the changes each by each and figure which ones are upstreamable and what shape could I be upstreaming this, how do I need to modify that in order to meet upstream um, requirements, and would then actually commit that into the upstream project where possible. Um, so out of those 100 change sets that were actually identified there, Approximately 30 were just too Nokia device specific, so they couldn't be going into upstream. But that means that means a vast majority of those changes actually went into upstream one way or the other. But most of them had to be redone, they had to be identified, which is why the entire effort actually took four years. But in the end, you can find all those changes that went into the, uh, into the platform back in the day. Um, in all GDK versions that have been released since GDK 2.10. So in the end, it was a success. So, have an open source project at the client. Now, Nokia is just an example here who didn't do the right thing at the start. And um, if, you, if you happen to be having a client at that phase, what you actually need to be doing is you need to help the client to understand. Open source project means there's a community behind it. Development is happening in upstream, not on your servers. Um, Feature development goes on in upstream. That means if you want new features, you need to communicate with upstream. If you want to see new features in the open source project, you have to push it towards upstream. So stability and security fixes are happening in upstream. You want those. That means you want to keep your code in a way so that you can easily merge changes and improvements from upstream. Internationalization and localization is something that many companies in a proprietary context um, don't have the budget for or at least don't focus on for a start. But many open source projects can actually do these kind of efforts fairly early on um, if they gather enough contributors, especially um, internationalization like, or translations of, um, of user visible strings in a project doesn't require so many software developers. It can be regular contributors who are non-programmers. So that's why sometimes it's really easy for an open source project to be attracting people as the product is widely used, even though a company couldn't forefront the effort uh, upstart. So that's another thing. It goes on in upstream. You want to think with that if there's a slight possibility that your uh, project is, might be used outside of your localization context. Um, 
Now, the community means that contributors are actually deciding on priorities, and that means it's useful for you to be upstream. <laughs> okay. Um, SDK is another project that you can find on the internet. It's on Gitorious. Um, there, was, there was a company who created this mobile toolkit uh, behind closed doors. At some point, they took it and they put it out there, like an open source release. There was no community behind it. They didn't make an effort to build a community. Basically, there's a code drop there, it's a couple of years old, and nothing has ever happened ever after to that project. So it's, that's really a failing project. That's not how you do open source. Um, you have to explain to the client, OK, this is uh, an upstream again. Why strive for upstream? I think I touched on that already. Um, then we might skip that, because I'm a bit short on the time here. Um, Right. So, and this is a bit on what I described earlier on. If you happen to be working with a client who is on open source, you need to establish a process with them. The first step is to educate them about how open source works. The second is to establish this kind of process where you make clear that you have to you have to stay with the upstream version by merging changes from upstream into your software fairly early on. Um, actually irregularly, and merge back your changes into upstream. And here's another project that actually got it right. And this is, again, Nokia, but it's a couple years later. So they learned from their first experience. For the Tracker project, they asked around which one, uh, what project, what open source project out there would be most useful to be indexing the data. And then they got into the community, they put consultants and their own employees on it, and all of them worked together in order to be improving the Tracker project. So it could be indexing data much faster. It could be running on a mobile device. And they add a lot of features to it by working together with the community. So that's a software project done right on open source. And that also shows that Companies can learn how to do open source properly if you just make an effort. Okay, we actually we touched on that. So here's another one uh, that does open source really, really well. The um, the tracker project I just showed here at Nokia, they actually had their own branch still with their own specific changes, but um, the old PC project, one laptop per child, is drawing most of the most of the components that they're working on from upstream projects or projects that they, they're working on themselves or into the sugar user interface, they are releasing that upstream regularly. So that's one of those, those projects that does open source really, really well. How much more time do I got? Yeah, OK, then we might actually skip fears and reservations because some of the clients actually you have to you have to convince uh, that open source is the proper way, and then you have to face these kind of fears when that forks could be happening. But in, um, for the most part, those are not real problems. Um, Linux. Linux is actually, oh, I'm sorry. Ah, uh, where are, uh, here. Yeah. So Linux is a project uh, running the Munich municipality on Linux. Um, they, are, they are using their own distributions uh, distribution uh, to an extent because they have so many changes, but that's a fork done right. Um, they, they are looking to regularly back contributing their changes and they have so many, let's say, specific changes for the way that Munich operates, that it makes sense to be maintaining your own source code tree for a while. Okay, licensing. Licensing is another thing that uh, Obviously, you need to talk with your client about licensing if you do an open source with them. And what you're often facing is they are expecting licensing to be working somewhat like with proprietary software project, which means they are used to be able to dictate the licensing terms. Um, they usually want to be the exclusive party who has access to the source code. So that's part of the education process. You're not the exclusive party for be using the open source. Um, and yeah, the patent claim thing. You'll find that in almost every contract you have to sign. The thing is that you just cannot, this is the last point here, you just cannot hold a big corporation harmless for patent claims. Patent claims that could be any of those. Some countries you have software patents, like in the US, some countries you don't, like in Germany, and then do have again because there are some patents in Germany that are engineering patents that do actually apply to software because companies are trying to play tricks on the system. So basically, um, 
if, you're doing, if you do have a client and open source project, make sure that the contract doesn't require you to be holding them harmless or patent claims because it's something you're never ever going to be able to do. The only company who can actually afford to do that is Red Hat and they are offering a program whereby if you purchase a Red Hat license they're going to be holding you harmless and they've just recently defended their first case in court that, that, that they were fighting on, on behalf of one of their clients and they won that. Right, and the other points are obviously also important. You have to make the client understand that if he wants to contribute back to upstream, of course that cannot be to his own licensing terms, but he has to use the license that is uh, used in the upstream project. LibreOffice would be LGPL, Linux kernel would be GPL, um, Apache it would be the Apache license. That usually means for the client, he has to contact his lawyers just to figure out how exactly they're going to be doing the legal uh, work and, and the actual process in order to be complying with upstream licensing terms. Which means, uh, if you're doing a project with, an, uh, with a client who's entering open source newly, address this point fairly early on because legals usually take time. Oh, cop copyrights. Um, so often people don't actually know what kind of copyright to use uh, when they're working for a client. What most often, um, the client owns the code that you're writing to extend, but it's still being released on the open source license, uh, which means you can put in your code copyright and the year and the client you've been working for. So in this case, this is, this is a snippet that would be used in a uh, Google project. Google actually owns the copyright because they funded the project for a consultant, and here's a consultant. It actually makes a lot of sense to be keeping the original person who wrote the code in the code for future contact. Even if, you, if the project with Google has stopped, the person might still be able to answer in questions. Um, and sometimes, in like uh, relicensing scenarios and some other scenarios, it's, it's also good to be having that, uh, that person around. Also, this touches on establishing the credibility and exp uh, expertise of the company funding it in the first place and the consultant and the individual. Oh, and a quick word on copyright assignments. If you happen to be working on a, on a project that does copyright assignments, for the most part, that's not the best idea. And just some recent cases have shown that. For instance, MySQL used to have copyright assignments to Oracle, and Oracle just recently relicensed all their manual pages by accident because they had a script gone wild on their manual pages. Simon Phipps actually wrote an article about that if you're interested. The thing is that accidental relicensing can happen if there is a single entity holding the entire copyright. And what it also means is single point of failure, single point of power, you might actually say. A company can be bought out and change the lights on a project, for instance, take it from copyleft to permissive or entirely proprietary, and that means for the most part the project is gone. So um, if you don't have copyright assignments, these kind of things usually cannot happen because you'd, ha you'd be having to contact too many parties uh, to actually make that happen. Naughty Loss is a good example for that. So there was Easel. Easel is a, uh, was a startup in, one, in, in 1999. Uh, we were starting a company that would develop um, a file manager for the GNOME desktop project, and the file manager is called Nautilus. Now, Isa worked on that for two or three years, and then they figured they couldn't really make this work in a commercially viable way, and basically the, the company ban went bankrupt, and many of those developers were actually hired by Apple later on. But Nautilus, from day one, was released under a copyleft license, which means even the company going away didn't affect uh, the, uh, the file browser to be available for the community. Nautilus is the default file manager for GNOME up to this day. So that's one of the main benefits of open source. Even if your company goes bankrupt, even if people walk away, the code is still there for the community. Uh, like the wider society actually benefits from that. So th that's, that's really preserving investment, uh, especially also from an individual's perspective. You've been working on code, and some 10 years later, even though you change company, it's still being used out there. It's still free. People are still free uh, contributing, contributing to it in a free fashion. What? Ah, okay, yeah, so either went bankrupt <laughs> or it was still a good open source project. And uh, up to this day it is. Uh, okay, pricing. I might just quickly say that because many, maybe some people are actually interested in that. If you do happen to have a a client who wants to do open source, for the most part, you cannot do the regular kind of pricing that we do for a proprietary project, which is per seat or per core, and these kind of 
things usually don't work for open source because people can do whatever they want with it. What you can do, however, if you're a consultant is you can price them for milestones. So, so you happen to be developing on software. Do you deliver at some point up to an agreed milestone? And that's when you invoice or, uh, yeah, basically that's when you invoice a fixed price or you just invoice the number of hours that you've been working on something. So basically, working on open source isn't a product-based business model, it's a service-based business model. Okay, and then companies are generally able to pay a bit more than individuals if you just happen to be having that kind of uh, freedom degree in, in your pricing. And um, another thing that you should be uh, worrying about in your contract is don't guarantee that you are upstream something uh, because in general that means collaborating with other people who might actually have reasons for things not to be upstreamable uh, but for the most part you, you can always promise to be submitting something upstream which is often good enough for a client that is uh, well educated in open source and the ah Okay, it's on one of the other slides. An experienced open source programmer actually has a very good gut feeling about what kind of things can go into up upstream and which ones cannot. Actually, this is a bit more detail about what I just said. Time and materials projects are the ones where you're billing by the hour. Fixed price are the ones where you're billing by the milestone. Now, there's, a, there's an interesting difference in risk here. If you're if you're billing fixed price, that usually means you make an estimate, you have stick to that, uh, you have to stick to that. Um, and uh, if you messed up the estimate, if you messed up the development effort, then the risk is on your side. You have to put in more effort than you originally wanted to or that you have the resources for. While if you do time and materials, the risk is pretty much with the client. The client pays you by the hour. If a conflict becomes larger, bigger, more complex, directions change, the client pays for that. So it's basically uh, them taking on the risk there. Here's another open source project that was done right. Altair is a company who are doing car simulation. And they're actually using this, uh, they actually have an, a proprietary software project that does this. But they're using GTK. And they've been using GTK under Windows. And the simulations over the years would become more and more complex, which means they need more and more CPU. And they need more and more RAM. And at some point, they hit the 4 gigabyte limit on, on the 32 bit machines and they wanted to move the entire thing to 64-bit in order to have more RAM, more power and do more complex simulations. Now the problem was that the GTK toolkit behind this, which is a free software project, uh, was 32-bit only on Windows. So the 64-bit port of GTK on Windows was something that they needed but there weren't any um, community, community people working on it. So that's a contract that they hired out to a consultant um, we actually implemented that in, within a couple of months. We delivered that and they could move on to another software platform, move on their own software, have more complex simulation. And uh, even though they weren't, they weren't the best educated client about open source, the one thing that they did right is they got an open source consultant who would know how to do all the things for them. So with Nokia that I mentioned earlier, they actually had to learn how to do open source themselves. This is a company that just figured they could outsource this entire, uh, the entire complexity of dealing with open source to a consultant who would do it for them. And so that still means open source project done right, even though the company might not be open source up to, uh, let's say, every employee. So if you do, I touched on that earlier, um, if you do a fixed price project, you have to do estimates. And this is actually more general uh, project estimation. There are a lot of things to consider. Actually, uh, my company has recently run a blog about this, so if you're interested, you can just go to lanita.com and read up more details on how to do project estimations. This is one of the uh, techniques that we use that turn to be out uh, to be really effective for us. We're doing optimistic, realistic, and pessimistic estimates for implementing something that could be coming from different people. Um, and then you can read up on three-point estimation uh, on Wikipedia, how it's done. Uh, you can actually figure what would be meaningful, what would be a typical estimate with an associated confidence value. So to a specific degree, you can be confident about uh, the estimate uh, that you did and you maybe go for 95 or 98 percent if you want to be really sure uh, to be meeting the requirements because you're doing a fixed price project. for. Um, 
for time and tears project, you might be going for a lower uh, confidence value even because the client is taking on the risk. Depends on how exactly you're going to be agreeing with the client on, uh, on that. So as I said, you can actually read this up on Wikipedia. It turned out to be really useful for us. We would usually query an estimate for, for a bunch of, from a bunch of team members, get the most optimistic one, do an average of the realistic ones, and get all the pessimistic estimates from them, and then just run that through a spreadsheet that would give us a specific confidence value. And then management gets to pick uh, the amount of confidence that they want to have. And that has, uh, that has worked out pretty well. Actually, we've been fairly... Uh, fairly accurate with our estimates in the past, over, over the past couple of years. That also is because we have experienced developers. Okay, last slide. <laughs> so I promised some insights from this. I'm going to sum, sum up uh, what I covered here, some parts of which I will be jumping on because we have, we're so short in time. So many companies are using open source. Sometimes they don't know about it. Often they don't understand it, they have to learn it. Actually, these days it's better. I was going to give a Nokia example here because uh, they didn't know how to do open source at the start of the 2000s. They learned it in 2006, 7, 8, 9. By this point, they completely dropped open source and went over to Windows. And at this point, they're even going to be bought by Microsoft, so you can forget that example, actually. But uh, it would have been a really successful story if you just skipped the end. <laughs> um, so clients often need educating. Even companies that are used to open source make them aware of the licenses that are applying to the open source project because that usually means they need to go to the lawyers, which is here. So make sure, even though you have a, you have a company that knows open source already, uh, you enter a new open source project with them, make them aware of the specific licensing. It might be very different from the licensing on the last open source project they did which means completely different kind of things to be doing, uh, they have to be done legally. Um, successful projects have to synchronize with upstream. You're going to be having unmaintainable, different code bases otherwise. Um, you're lacking out on stability, security fixes, you never get your features into upstream if you don't work with them regularly. If you're developing for the Linux kernel and you develop a feature that you want to see in the Linux kernel, make damn sure you ping the maintainers at least every week to get your change in. Because the Linux kernel is, is moving so fast, we're talking hundreds of changes merged per day, that it's really, really easy to be diverging from upstream so quickly that you just have to redo your whole implementation half a year later. So strive for upstreaming as early as possible, especially if it's an extremely fast-moving project. Linux kernel might be one, WebKit could be one, LibreOffice is one. Um, oh, yeah, and then I gave the Altair example earlier. If the client doesn't perfectly know how to do open source, see how much can be shifted towards the consultant, because a lot of the open source stuff can possibly be taken over by the consultant. Companies that are developing their own platform, Moblin, Migo, Android, whatever, they need to know how to do open source themselves. But many other companies who just occasionally happen to be open, using open source, which is critical in a few spots, they might just be uh, able to outsource that to a consultant they trust. Thanks a lot for your attention. And I'm happy to be taking any questions, if there are any. Hi, uh, we have time for a quick question. Hands up if someone has a question. Thanks. Um, so, okay, uh, you said uh, you develop a program and you want to open source it. How do you get the community involved? Because at what point do you do like the other guys that's uh, fully fledged software and nobody wants to contribute? Uh, how do you get the community involved? There's actually nothing so special about open source here. Any product that you want to put out there, you want to build a community around. You can see that with proprietary games even. If you don't have a community around that, the game is usually useless because you don't have m more people joining it, more people paying uh, for the game. It's a bit similar with open source projects actually. You produce a good open source project, Actually, you shouldn't be doing too much of that behind closed doors. You, you should be open from the start, fairly early on. As, as soon as you get something usable, first put it out there, make easy instructions how to use it, like a README ins installation file, and then you start doing a bit of PR about it. You blog about it. If you, have a no, if you, have, if you start your own open source project, it's definitely usually worse to have its own blog. Um, Set, like, set two people aside in the company, one developing it, one doing PR about it, community maintenance. So you, you first you make a bit of PR about it, 
um, so people have a, have a chance of actually seeing it. And then you start building a community. Um, you add a blog, you add a forum that can be used to be asking questions, and most often you need a bug tracker fairly early on. You can go for something like GitHub, because GitHub enables you to be reading the source code um, and people to file bugs right away. So you don't have to be in a, in investing too much into infrastructure. You might need to be doing that later on. But for the most part, do a bit of PR about it and, and really take care of your community. Watch the forums every day. Uh, answer, answer questions that might be coming up. Help people with installing it. No. Um, <laughs> blog about your project. And um, you know what? Try to, because your blog might not actually be getting too much attention initially, uh, you cross post about your blog posts on social media channels, Google+, Facebook, whatever. Um, and you might actually approach Linux.com and ask them, can I run a guest blog post here and blog about my project? Because there's a million visitors going to Linux.com every day. If you get guest blog posts there, and actually they're quite open to guest blog posts, you can make your project known out there fairly quickly. And if it's any good, then people are going to be trying to install it and going to be asking questions about it, possibly contribute. Uh, be prepared for this to take a long time. Be prepared for the PR to be taken a long time. Be prepared for gathering developers to, to take a long time. Uh, basically, it's, it's with any other thing, uh, things that you want to grow. You have to plant the seeds, and then you have to nurture it. <laughs> There's another question over there. There's another question over there. Sorry, that's all the time we have. <laughs> okay, you can Sorry. just come over here and we're going to be handing that in person. So thanks for your attention again. Uh, thank you very much for Tim Yannick. Uh, next up we have Aaron Siegel. Thank